never underestimated the recoil from a firearm, and you've paid dearly, go ahead hit that subscribe button. If you got a scope ring, go ahead and hit that bell notification icon. Uh, love to hear it in the comment section. The comment section is sentient. It does its own thing, so go down there and see what they're all about. Um, guys, a big support of the channel right now is Gun Mag Warehouse. Get in there, get gun magazines uh, for a pretty cheap price. Discount code GRANTHUM. If you don't want those, you want some plaid, get to Vertex. They make awesome stuff. Discount code GRANTHUM, 25% off. Okay, moving over into the video for today. I think this video is requested a lot. Um, I don't know if people kind of know what they're looking for. But today we're going to be talk talking about the H&K 416. So, we are not talking about the MR556. This is an actual factory uh, short-barreled rifle from H&K, uh, an actual 416. And I had three different variants that I messed with. And we're going to talk about my experiences shooting these. So, about combined total, I have around 7,000 rounds on an H&K uh, 416. It's not as much as um, some of the other firearms that I've done, but I think enough to uh, say enough about it to uh, kind of give you guys a good review on it. So the 416 kind of, I don't know if it really needs an introduction, but uh, you've seen it in video games, uh, you've seen it in movies, you've seen it uh, everywhere, and maybe you've even argued about it online. So Larry Vickers, who was in Delta at the time, uh, in Delta, helped H&K develop the H&K 416. Um, it's a short stroke gas piston system as opposed to a direct impingement system. And this was to make a rifle that would just crush reliability, um, be better than an M4 in every single way. So does it? We'll see. We'll talk about it. So on this particular um, uh, short barrel rifle that I have right here, um, the H&K 416 upper is on a mil-spec AR-15 lower, in this case a Daniel Defense. Uh, so the MR556 uppers will typically, well, the older ones will not fit mil-spec lowers, but H&K 416 uppers will fit uh, your mil spec lowers. What's nice about that is that that allows you then to use just regular uh, magazines. Well, like P mags and that type of thing will work well, uh, as opposed to an H and K lower, which will require E mags or H and K magazines or Stenag magazines or something like that, where the P mags don't work well. So just as a quick note there. Now, if you are using a AR fifteen lower with your H and K four sixteen upper, what's important? are two main things. First off, the trigger. Either use a mil-spec trigger. Um, there are other triggers that work. In this case, I am using a Geisley H&K 416 trigger with about a 4.5 pound pull. Uh, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Geisley. Um, quick note there, Geisley did give me this trigger. The upper, however, was bought completely at me, left a large dent in my wallet. Also, the recoil system. Uh, H&K has their own proprietary spring and buffer. Well, not proprietary. You can use um, you know, regular AR-15 ones, but there's a lot of recoil going on in this, so it's recommended that you use Asian case. So quick note there for those of you who are thinking about buying one, even before we got into the review. How is the Asian K416 then? How does it stack up against um, you know, an AR-15? So when we're talking about the Asian K416, um, I'm going to be talking about the short barrel variant, which is a 10.3 uh, inch upper receiver. So why 10.4? Oh, the H&K, they're special. But in, in any case, this was made to compete with the Mark 18. Or not even the Mark 18, but short-barreled M4s. You have to realize that the time that this was developed, um, those short-barreled M4s were not doing that well as far as reliability is concerned. So this was developed to address those um, shortcomings. Now, currently, the Mark 18, in my opinion, is a very reliable weapon system, as is the HK416. But let's kind of get into it. So to kind of start off, um, we're going to do a whole pros and cons thing. We'll kind of drift a little bit into cons as we're talking, as I usually do, but uh, we're going to do our best here. So the first thing that should be noted is that on the H&K 416, the barrel is phenomenal. It has a cold hammer forged barrel with very well-made materials. The barrel life on these H&Ks is very, very good. Depending on firing schedule, you can expect these to last a very long time. Um, a good buddy of mine had one that ran about 67,000 rounds. Um, of course, he lost accuracy as uh, the round count went up and that type of thing. But realize that these barrels are very well made. And uh, I believe for a long time, they're considered among the best. Uh, perhaps they still are. So barrels are excellent on the H&K 416s. 
Uh, as far as accuracy is, is concerned, um, a DI gun typically is going to be a little bit more inherently accurate. Now, that being said, um, I think these guns are more accurate than anything that you could probably typically pull off. Um, what I mean to say is that it's, it's more accurate than you. So um, with this particular upper, I've been able to get about between 1.25 to 1.5 MOA groupings. I'm sure I can do better with a better optic and that type of thing. But the point is, is that I have no qualms about the accuracy of this particular system. So uh, for whatever reason you think that a piston gun is going to be like wildly more inaccurate, it's not the case. They're still very well made. And in the case of the 416, it is a free-floated um, handguard, and that, of course, helps with accuracy as well. So compared to, like, say, a standard M4, um, I would say it is inherently more accurate. Now, compared to, say, a um, kind of a modern-out free-floated AR-15, maybe the uh, free-floated AR-15 has a small advantage, um, but that being said, these are plenty accurate. All right, going up from the barrel, we have the gas system. So the gas system is not a direct contingent. It is a short stroke gas piston system. So how do they differ? Well, on a AR-15, in this case, we're gonna take the direct competitor to the HK416 or that particular one, and we have a Mark 18 right here. So the Mark 18 is a short barreled variant of the M4. So in a Mark 18 or an AR-15, when the bolt is traveling down the barrel, once it passes that gas port, all that gas that is trapped behind the, the bullet as it's leaving the barrel, uh, is tapped off into a gas tube. That gas tube then runs the length down into the receiver where it in impinges upon the bolt carrier group um, and then pushes that entire thing backwards and spring, cycles the weapon, all that kind of stuff. So end result is that you get a bunch of hot gases into the chamber uh, with carbon fouling that fouls up the weapon faster than you would have with a piston design such as the HK416. So in the HK416, that Bullet travels down the barrel, hits that tap-off point, gas goes into a chamber, and impinges upon a piston up front. That pigeon then has a piston then has a rod that travels down and impinges upon the bolt carrier group, and the receiver pushes that back, cycles it. So the end result is that you don't have quite as much gas coming back into the receiver compared to a direct impingent gun. So because of that, the receiver runs cleaner, and obviously the bolt carrier group and the bolt and all that kind of stuff have to rotate and move and slide through that receiver. So because you have less gas and carbon fouling getting into there, um, you have a more typically reliable weapon system than say a DI gun. So that is kind of the purpose behind the piston system. Now there are some problems with the piston system. Uh, it's heavy. So you have a lot more moving parts out front. Because of that, um, the weapon is significantly more front heavy than something like a Mark 18 or AR-15 or anything like that. Now, people are going to be quick to point out, uh, why don't you work out, uh, you know, a little weight's no big deal. And you say that now, but uh, hold this weapon up for long periods of time, uh, doing CQB and that type of thing, and you're going to really begin to feel it as you move through those buildings. So weight does matter, uh, even a small amount of weight forward, because this gun isn't much heavier than a Mark 18, but it's still heavy enough that you definitely feel the difference in such a short barreled rifle, even still. Talking about the gas system, we have to mention the 416. So the 416 was designed to be a very reliable weapon system. Um, one of the ways that they did that was in addition to incorporating the piston, the short stroke gas piston on the HEK416 to ensure you have less fouling, uh, they also viciously overgas this thing. What that means is that they have a lot more gas uh, going into that chamber to actuate the piston than is really needed. But what that does is it ensures that if I have any fouling going on, that it's gonna power through that, that it's gonna have enough energy to break from any debris or anything like that, any sand or snow or ice or anything like that. Because of that, it's a very reliable system, in my opinion. Now, a couple problems that come from that. One is felt recoil. And this is what everybody, I think, fails to address when it comes to the 416. Well, not everybody, but typically in reviews or video games, is that for all that reliability and everything, you have a lot more kick so what that means is that when I'm looking through my dot and I'm firing this weapon uh, on automatic or semi-automatic or anything like that, I can watch that dot bouncing a lot more and I can feel a lot more recoil impulse and a lot more muzzle rise than I would feel 
Now compare that to a Air 15 Mark 18 type system with a direct impingent. Um, it's a very soft recoiling system. But again, there are gonna be sacrifices to be made to have a little bit more reliability in the case of the piston system. They just wanted an ultra reliable system. So I understand what they're going for. So when a lot of people pick up a HK416 and they fire, they go, wow, that's so much recoil. Uh, what is HK's problem? And just realize that their problem was is that they didn't want a problem. So that is the, the reason why the HK416 has such a vicious kind of recoil impulse compared to an AR-15, even though they look very, very similar. Now, in addition to that, the piston system makes it particularly reliable in a couple different conditions, um, Arctic conditions and also maritime conditions, which was very well uh, kind of showcase in that video of the uh, German man sitting in a koi pond shooting an HK416 and an M4 and yelling at us in German. A great video. But in, in any case, uh, the Norwegians have adopted this as their rifle and it has performed very well. So on some of the newer HK variants that are coming out, there is an adjustable gas block. Now, Norway has famously had some trouble with theirs but there is a newer H and K416 coming out, the A5, which has an adjustable gas block, which could probably help with some of the vicious overgassing that the current H and K systems have. Just want to make a quick note there of that. Where the H and K416 really shines is when you get into a triple threat. So by triple threat, I mean short barrel, suppressed, and full auto. So if you're doing all those things, a piston gun is typically going to be a little bit better. And the reason for that is that the piston system seems to handle that full auto fire um, a little bit better. And the reason for that is you're gonna have a little bit less gas blowback on a full auto suppressed short barreled 416 compared to a Mark 18. And the reason for that, of course, is that you have less gas traveling back into the system. Now, no matter what, you're going to have gas blowback coming back through the chamber of the gun, just no matter what. And you can see it in the slow-mo videos. You're going to have that no matter what you do, but it's going to be a lot less on Mark 18. You're not gonna get quite as much coming up through the charging handle and that type of thing because you're not shooting those hot gases directly into the receiver. Another great thing about the H and K416 is that there are a lot of great aftermarket parts out there for this particular rifle. So I have one of them on my gun right now, which is the Geisley Rail. So the Geisley Rail doesn't weigh less than the um, H and K Rail, but what it does do is it weighs about the same amount while giving you two sling points as well as extending past the gas block which allows you to mount your accessories a little bit further out. So I'm a big fan of the Geisley rail and I use them on all my H and K 416s that I've used. Uh, another thing is of course going to be the Geisley trigger. Again, I'm not trying to sound like a Geisley spokesperson because there are other great products, but in this case I think the Geisley trigger is perhaps one of the best for the H and K 416. It has a 4.5 pound pull. I'm a big fan of the Geisley triggers. They're just superior to mil spec triggers. Now, as far as groupings are concerned, um, compared to like an AR-15, um, I am a little bit slower with an H and K416. And the reason for that is because of that vicious recoil. Um, it's harder for me to bring my dot back into target before I can get that second shot off. So when I'm doing anything like a bill drill or something like that, uh, my times are significantly, well, not significantly, but about a solid 0.10 or 0.20 slower compared to an AR-15 or a Mark 18 or something like that. Now, at the same time, is that like a huge deal? No. Um, probably a little bit more training on the H&K 416 and it'd be just as good um, kind of managing that recoil and getting better at it. But I have to try harder with the H&K 416 to shoot as fast as I do with a Mark 18 as accurately. So I did a couple tests here with the H&K 416. I fired it semi for six rounds. I did it suppressed for six rounds. And then I also did it um, full auto, both unsuppressed and suppressed to kind of look at my groupings. Uh, my groups are better when they are when they are uh, uh, semi-auto than they are auto and that's just due to the fact that the cyclic rate on the H&K 416 is a little bit out of control and because of that it's a little bit harder for me to control that gun to keep it on target um, for sustained fire.
So now that we've kind of seen that, uh, I do want to make a couple quick notes, a couple quick fixes. I don't want to just throw, say, you know, a couple things without saying that, you know, you can make some certain things better. So on the HNK416, we talked about that vicious recoil cycle. So you can tame it. There are aftermarket buffers. Um, Lucas from T-Rex Arms used a very heavy buffer, and that helped him really tame his rifle. And the recoil is very nice on his particular 416. Now, the problem with that is that he slowed down the system so much that um, if he wasn't using really hot ammo, that sometimes he would get failures to eject or extract and that type of thing. So just realize that um, you can tame it, but just realize that there might be problems as you kind of do this. You need to find the balance based on what type of ammo you're shooting or whether it's suppressed or unsuppressed, and that will kind of help you figure out what buffer uh, weight you're going to need and that type of thing. Um, again, if you do end up getting one of the newer um, HGK 416s as they become available, I don't believe they're available to civilians quite yet with the adjustable gas blocks that are that work very well, um, you might see that, that thing kind of no longer be an issue where you don't have to change your buffer weights. Because again, uh, we're kind of on the impetus of a lot of, uh, on a lot of HK 416 uppers and parts kits being released. So there's a quick note there. So as far as our cons are concerned, we've kind of talked about them a lot as we've kind of been going through the pros, but basically what you have is you have a viciously overgassed system, which has a reason, there's a purpose behind it. Uh, because of that, you have a very stiff recoil impulse, which makes you a little bit slower on this gun than you would, would be on an AR or something like that. Um, as well, it's heavy. It weighs more than an AR-15, and it's more front-heavy, which leads to a little bit more fatigue when you're doing CQB-type stuff. But again, nothing comes, uh, nothing's free, right? So if you want an ultra-reliable weapon, then you're going to have to make some sacrifices. So again, if you're looking to buy an HK416, just realize uh, kind of what you're sacrificing. Uh, I know I've talked a lot about reliability when it comes to this gun. I've said, hey, it's ultra-reliable, it works really well, that type of thing. And absolutely, this is a very reliable weapon system. But that's not to discount at all the reliability of modern AR-15s and Mark 18s, such as the one that we have right here. Uh, they're also incredibly reliable and work very, very well. It's just that in the case of the HK 416, that reliability is taken to a ridiculous extreme. So whether or not you are going to get one kind of depends on what you do and your purpose. So again, if you're shooting full auto suppressed short barrel, I think the 416 is a really great option. Um, there are other great piston options out there. Realize that the the HK416 is not the only kind of AR pattern rifle that runs a piston, and we'll be talking about those more in the future. Um, but it is definitely a good option should you need that kind of ultra reliability. Do realize um, when it comes to the HK416 that there are a lot of proprietary parts, like the gas piston system itself and the bolt. Some some of these parts are definitely interchangeable with the AR15, but not all of them. And because of that, you're looking to pay a little bit of a premium if you have any type of problems with the HK416. On top of that, the HK416 is ridiculously expensive. Um, I got this upper for a pretty cheap price at about uh, $2,900, but that was cheap. Um, I've seen them for more expensive, some for less expensive, but the point is, is that you're paying, paying a lot of money um, for not a huge performance increase as far as reliability is concerned, and you're getting a lot more muzzle rise, a lot more recoil. So for you know civilians, yeah, you can buy it. There's definitely a cool factor to it, and it's very reliable. But at the same time, um, you know, just realize what you're running into. Departments kind of understand that because you have such a viciously overgassed system, you're going to have a little bit more parts wear compared, compared to like a direct impingent gun. So if you're going to be like out in the middle of nowhere, like just not able to clean your gun for whatever reason, then yeah, the 416 makes sense. You know, you're, uh, you're doing like a raid on a Taliban compound. Yeah, you're about to smoke Osama bin Laden. The 416 did it. It's great. But in most cases, I really do believe that the direct impingent AR-15 is a better choice. Now, we've talked a lot about the short-barreled H&K 416. So when it comes to the longer variants, like the 14.5 and the 16-inch barrel H&K 416, they're excellent. Um, some of the problems that this weapon has, they don't have due to a longer barrel length um, and some less, it's less overgassed. So because of that, you have less parts wear and that type of thing. 
But when it gets to 14, 5, and 16, the kind of benefits of the HK416 start to bleed off, and I think that you're actually better with just a direct impingent gun. So if you want to go as short as possible on a AR-15 style weapon, I think that the 416 has a lot going for it. The Mark 18 has kind of always been on the bleeding edge of reliability with such a short barrel. The 416 solves that. It's a very reliable weapon system. Again, you're going to have all those problems that go along with it. So just know what you're getting yourself into. Again, I can't make that choice for you. And undoubtedly, the HK416 looks very, very cool. But you're only going to look cool if you know what you're doing. So guys, make sure that you get training. Training is what matters. Without training, um, you know, all your cool toys are just that, toys. So get trained on them. Again, we got Cogworks, Bear Solutions, Esoteric, Haley Strategic, all great companies. Get in there. Uh, get that training from them, guys. Send, tell them that I sent you, and they'll probably be creeped out, which is great. <laughs> Besides that, guys, I um, hope you've enjoyed our little talk on the h and um, Get in there, discuss it, and I've got nothing else for you. Last thing I got for you is friends. Uh, your family is very important and because they're always going to be there. You know, you're always going to be kind of a part of that family. Maybe not some people lost their families, but friends are, are kind of interesting. You just find kind of another human being that you're not related to and you're like, I like this person. We're going to spend a lot of time together. Uh, friends are important, guys. Make sure that uh, you're there for them, I guess is my point. Um, I've had a lot of buddies recently in the military who've been having a lot of really tough issues and uh, they've been kind of quiet about it and I haven't been able to help them out. So take that time to check on your buddies, whether you're in the military or law enforcement or whether you're a civilian, it doesn't matter. Take that time to show that you care for them and to be there for them because that's kind of what matters. Gunfighting is really cool, but friendships and that kind of real stuff that we've always talked about is what matters. So that's kind of our message for today, my dad advice. So again, <laughs> I've got one last thing for you and that is if you've gotten this far, you know what we're going to talk about, Big Daddy Unlimited. So again, super cheap subscription service. Get products really cheap. I use it for a lot of products. Again, it depends on how many products you buy. It's like 10 bucks a month. And then you get super cheap uh, firearm products. Again, it works if you're spending the money to buy stuff. So if you're not, uh, if you're buying stuff like once a year, probably not worth it. If you're buying stuff once a month, you're probably going to save yourself at least $10, in which case Big Daddy Unlimited is worth it. And finally, if you've gotten this far, I want you guys to comment with, your favorite flavor of ice cream. Yes, your favorite flavor of ice cream. We're gonna do that. Mine is mint chocolate chip. Oh, I love it so much. Guys, thanks for watching. We're done, I promise we're done now. Bye.